Good afternoon, I am Giuseppe Iannacone. Let me first thank the organizers for inviting me to present a talk on graphene as a material for nanoelectronics. And uh, I apologize for not being able to reach Vancouver. I hope you enjoy a very interesting and stimulating conference. Uh, I hope I will be able to reply to your questions after this talk or offline if you just drop me an email. I wish to acknowledge my co-authors from the University of Pisa and our funding sources. This talk will be largely based on research funded by the European Commission and the Italian National Research Council. The high mobility at room temperature and the symmetric structure for electrons and holes are extremely interesting for using graphene as a material for electronics. Actually, the perspective of graphene-based electronics ranks high among the many reasons for the explosive growth of interest in graphene in recent years. However, graphene has also a zero energy gap, which represents a serious impediment for its use as a channel material of FETs. The reason is shown here on the left. You can see the band edge profile of an FET in the off state. If the energy gap is small, Interband tunneling can be significant, leading to a degraded, which means too large, off-state current. On the other hand, if the energy gap is large enough, as here, on the right, interband tunneling is suppressed and the off-state can be satisfactory. In the last four years, several options to induce a band gap in graphene have been pursued with mixed results, especially from the manufacturability point of view. Now, what is the role of modeling in this context? Here is how we see it. First, we need to be optimistic. I mean, we need to assume that the clever scientists working on device fabrication will improve the technology up to a point in which they are able to fabricate the device we now only dream of. After that, we need to ask some relevant questions. What's their performance compared to silicon devices? What are their intrinsic limitations? Do we see any prohibitive manufacturability issue? And finally, can we support experimental developments? To answer these questions, we use numerical simulation tools for higher physical detail and semi-analytical models for a fast exploration of the design space. In particular, many of the results I will show have been obtained with nano TCAD vides a numerical simulation tool developed in PISA primarily by Gianluca Fiori. It is a device simulator based on the non-equilibrium Green's functions and on an atomistic tight binding Hamiltonian. It assumes fully coherent transport and can treat generic 3D structures, for example, for example, FETs based on carbon nanotubes, graphene nanoribbons, B-layer graphene, but also silicon and 3,5 nanowire transistors even if those devices can only be treated with an effective mass approximation. I mention because this code in part because of a bit of self-promotion, because we have released it with an open source BSD license. If anybody is curious, can find a web-based version of the program on the Purdue Nano Hub with complete documentation and the link to download the source code. Several options have been proposed to induce a gap in graphene. First is lateral confinement, which means defining graphene nanoribbons. Very nice experiments are available, but we shall see that very narrow ribbons and single atom precision is required. Then bilayer graphene is a 2D material and therefore has the big advantage of not requiring prohibitive lithography, but can provide a relatively small gap. Epitaxial graphene on SICK is especially promising for wafer level fabrication and has been shown to provide a slightly larger gap. Finally, graphene functionalization is gaining attention given the recent demonstration of graphene. But here the, challenge, the challenges lie in the associated intrinsic variability and the poor mobility that one can expect. First, let's consider nanoribbons. 
Here, there are very beautiful experiments available. I'm showing here some impressive transfer characteristics obtained at room temperature by the group of Angidae at Stanford from backgated nanoribbons narrower than 10 nanometers. I think you can appreciate the excellent current modulation of up to six orders of magnitude. Armchair nanoribbons have always a semiconducting gap. This represents an important advantage with respect to carbon nanotubes. However, the gap has huge variations if the number of dimer lines in the width direction changes only by one. For example, let us consider the three nanoribbons indicated in orange. In all cases, the width is smaller than two nanometers. You see the large variation of the energy gap, but now we are interested in evaluating what is the effect of the variation of the energy gap on the electrical characteristics of the double gate FET. We consider a nanoribbon channel with gate length of 15 nanometers and oxide thickness of just 2 nanometers. Here are transfer characteristics computed with our NEGF code, in semi-log scale on the left and in linear scale on the right. As you can see, the nanoribbon with the smallest gap, the 14-0, is associated with the lowest threshold voltage, but above, but above all with very poor subthreshold behavior. In practice, the device cannot be switched off. It's very clear if you look at the picture on the right. In this case, edge roughness can be of help because it effectively averages over different widths. Here, the rough edge FET is represented by the dashed line in both figures. As you can see, the subthreshold behavior is only slightly degraded at the price of a reduced on current of about, let's say, 30%. The thing can be seen more clearly in this slide. Here, you can see a picture on the rough edge nanoribbon. The red line is the transfer characteristics corresponding to an ideal nanoribbon, and the blue line to a nanoribbon with rough edges. The ion is suppressed because rough edges cause scattering and therefore reduce the mobility, while the I off is increased because there are localized states in the gap, as can be seen in this grayscale map of the density of states shown on the right. The localized states in the gap increase the quantum capacitance of the channel and therefore degrade the capability of the gate to control the potential of the channel. Let's now move to bilayer graphene. Some theoretical works from 2006 and experiments in the last two, three years have demonstrated that a vertical electric field can open a gap in bilayer graphene. We can therefore devise an FET in which the gap is maximum precisely when we need it, which means when the device must be switched off. We apply this concept simulating a double gate FET with a bilayer graphene channel. It is shown here, the gate length is 15 nanometers, the gate dielectric is 2 nanometer thick silicon oxide. Let's look at the transfer characteristics, and actually they are depressing. Uh, basically one cannot switch the device off for a drain to source voltage of 0 0.5 volt. On the left, we fix the voltage of the bottom gate and sweep the top gate voltage. On the right, we impose a differential voltage on the two gates and sweep the common mode voltage. The result is practically the same and the ion of the right off ratio is of few units. Essentially, we are in a two small gap situation. Interband tunneling dominates current in the off state. We have also tried to explore the design space with the semi-analytical model but the result is still very bad. The ion over I-off ratio cannot be increased above 10. Furthermore, even engineering the source and drain doping and doping profile, 
and also adjusting the gate overlap, we are not able to improve things. Uh, it's interesting, I, I think, to look at the figure on the right. There's a grayscale map of the tunneling coefficient as a function of energy and of transverse wave vector. Uh, for the sake of clarity, let us superimpose the band edge profile. The white regions, where tunneling is zero, correspond to the gap regions in the source, in the channel and in the drain. Among them, you can see dark regions, meaning that tunneling, and in this case, interband tunneling, is significant. I want to stress the fact that this observation does not contradict recent experiments in Berkeley in which a large conductance modulation is observed in a B-layer graphene FET structure. The fact is that this experiment is performed in a quasi-linear region when the drain to source voltage is very, is very small. And in this case, as shown in this band edge profile, interband tunneling can be completely inhibited. However, in digital applications, the drain to source voltage has to be equal to the gate voltage sweep range, which must be at least 0 0.4, 0 0.5 volt to have a reasonable ion over eye off ratio with conventional FETs. To take advantage of the small gap and to reduce the supply voltage, we have considered tunnel FETs. Here, the small gap is useful to have a large interband tunneling, which leads to a large on current. Source and drain have to be optimized in terms of doping and overlap to reduce the off current. Let me just stress the fact that source and drain are differently doped in a tunnel FET. For example, the source can be N doped and the drain can be P doped. Okay, we, we have used Nanotech Advides for performing uh, atomistic simulation of these devices. And here you can see the transfer characteristics for a drain to source voltage of 0 0.1 volts for a varying differential voltage between the two gates. It's clear that the current modulation is large and the subtraction slope is very steep. Let's look here. From the figure on the left, you can see that the overlap is important to suppress the off current. In particular, the larger the overlap, the smaller the off current. On the right, you can see the transfer characteristics of a single gate FET where the bottom oxide is thick and the bottom gate voltage is kept fixed, providing a constant back bias. The transfer characteristics are not symmetric anymore, of course, but the subtraction slope is still very steep. Uh, one can obtain an ion over I off ratio close to 10 to the fourth with a supply voltage of only 100 millivolts. I, I, we think this type of devices can be really interesting and are very prone to circuit integration uh, because just because of the fact the back gate is kept at the same voltage for all the devices in the same circuits and one just need to modify the top gate voltage. Uh, we're really eager to see experiment in this type of devices. Now we turn to epitaxial graphene on silicon carbide. This very interesting experimental work from Berkeley demonstrated an energy gap of 0 0.26 eV probably induced by substrate coupling. We should stress the fact that additional experimental confirmation by other group is needed on this point, but however, let us be optimistic and see where this material would allow to realize good transistors. In this case, we have used the same analytical model to explore the design space in terms of geometry, materials, and doping levels. The plot in the center shows the transfer characteristics for different values of VDS. We see that for larger VDS, 
the subthreshold slope becomes worse because the drain inject holes that increase the quantum capacitance of the channel and therefore degrade the electrostatics. The supply voltage must therefore be chosen as a trade-off between the need to increase the gate voltage sweep and that to maintain a steep subthreshold behavior. The best condition is for VDS equal to 0.25 volts, just below the energy gap of graphene on silicon carbide. However, in this condition we are only able to obtain an ion over I-off ratio of 60. Also for this material, a tunnel FET is more interesting if the supply voltage is smaller than the energy gap. Here, the off current is mainly due to in-gap source to the tunneling or to thermionic current. And therefore, it can be reduced by using low doping at the source and drain contacts and by using longer channels. For example, we find that an I-on over I-off ratio larger than 10 to the fourth which means acceptable according to the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, can be achieved for a supply voltage of 150 or 200 millivolts and for a channel length of at least 30 nanometers. With this type of devices, CMOS inverters with a reasonable gain in excess of 5 can be obtained, as shown in the figure in the center and an intrinsic transition frequency FT of up to 1 terahertz can be reached, which is also very interesting. Let us stress that by intrinsic FVT, we mean that we do not consider parasitic capacitances, and therefore this value represents an upper limit to the transition frequency really achievable. The latest, in the sense of most recently proposed, option is graphene functionalization. Here in 2009, interesting experiments have appeared. First in Aachen, conductance variations of up to six orders of magnitude have been measured due to reversible chemical modification, probably hydrogenation. And then in Manchester, graphene has been experimentally demonstrated with an energy gap of 4-5 eV. From the point of view of modeling, one needs to couple a initial method of the type classically used in quantum chemistry with transport simulation. And this work by a group at CA in Grenoble, it has been observed that substitutional boron doping in graphene induces a conductance gap. Let us stress that a conductance gap is not a gap of the density of states. And that one needs to have a gap in, in an FET only to inhibit interband tunneling. And we really need to check whether a conductance gap is sufficient to inhibit interband tunneling. We have investigated the same issue using DFT to simulate graphene clusters with boron doping in order to extract type bonding parameters to be used in any GF transport simulation. We have observed that the actual energy gap, which means the gap of the energy of the density of states, strongly depends on the position of the impurity. For example, these two nanoribbons with the edge decoration are identical except for the position of the decorating boron impurities. The one on the left has an energy gap of 0.6 eV and the one on the right has an energy gap of only 30 milliEV. So this issue is now under investigation but in addition to band opening one really must to consider the doping induced variability of the electrical characteristics of these devices and the mobility suppression. To conclude we believe that at this stage, the early evaluation of technology options is the main role of modeling in the quest for carbon and molecular electronics. The present crucial, really pass or fail challenge of graphene and electronics is finding a way to induce a sufficient and reliable gap in graphene-based materials. To this end, 
graphene nanoribbons are not promising for the large-scale manufacturability challenge they pose. Bilayer graphene and epitaxial graphene on silicon carbide are promising, but only for tunnel FETs. Chemically modified graphene is an option to be explored, but the effects on mobility and on variability needs to be carefully pondered. Okay, this concludes my talk. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm waiting for your questions.